So last time I asked you, um, those of you who were here, how you can measure the success of a society. And the answer I gave, one of them, was that you can do so by observing the luxuries that are enjoyed by that society, but there's a higher standard of education, um, widespread health care. Um, but uh, the better answer I gave you was that you can do so by looking at the underlying factor that controls those luxuries, the very existences in that society. And that is the energy return on energy invested with the various um, energy and food production methods in use in that society. My work with Dr. Kare is specifically focused on nuclear energy um, in the hopes of helping determine how it's going to be used in the future. My name is Devin Schusterich, and I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding this research project, as well as the RU program here at UT for accepting it. So to recap, the EROEI is the ratio between the lifetime energy output versus the lifetime energy cost of that system. And for example, uh, nuclear energy, if, let's say you have a 35 year reactor, in that time it might produce as much as 965,000 gigawatt hours. Um, the costs associated with the mining, transportation, mining, what have you, all the different costs that go into producing the energy um, totals 120,000 hours. Um, the best case scenario with that technology, the EROEI is approximately eight, which is about on par with solar. It's a little bit higher in this case. So if you graph the relationship between the EROEI and the net energy percentage, the return on that, you get graphs like this. And essentially, as an energy resource's ERE drops, it eventually starts to, the, the energy costs begin to increase at an exponential rate. Um, and energy resources that have an ERE I of less than seven are sustainable for society for long term permanent growth. Um, that's the net energy foot, and that arrow here, that's where nuclear is, so it's right on the edge of that, not a little bit below based on our data. So why is this important? Um, this chart here was designed by a State University of New York professor, Dr. Charles Hall, and essentially the answer lies in this, and everything in our society as energy costs associated with it. That cost directly correlates to the average EROI of the, the society that's in. If it's really poor, all that society is capable of doing is supporting individual like family units. It's like here. Um, but as it increases, the society gains the ability to not only um, care for those immediate family members, but to educate the masses, to um, provide better health care to everyone, and leisure time to dedicate to the arts. So a majority of my work is tied directly around this spreadsheet uh, utility that was developed by the University of Sydney, Australia. And essentially what it does is gives you a lot of data that um, ties in these parameters that you can change. And you set the lifetime output and um, setting those things and you run it through, it calculates all of the energy resource costs that go into this. And knowing all of this plus this gives you your EROEI. And under the hood, this really big equation that's really hard to read because of the formatting that. Um, that's, that's what runs everything. So I don't show any of the graphs. So what I did was create an automated version of that spreadsheet utility, and it takes the same concepts and parameters, uses the same algorithm, um, and then combines them many times, outputs the vital information for us in certain text files that are formatted, so that I can um, graph them for me. Uh, these combinations are set up with a lower bound and upper bound and a step size that you can see at the bottom, that's how it's formatted in our system and the information that's printed out through these combinations here uh, 
include the settings that were used. The, every single time a calculation is performed, it prints it out. So you've got every run as a data set. And then a separate file is printed out that gives you the highest DREI, the lowest DREI, and the data sets that correlate to each of those. So you can compare the two there. And then I wrote a special version of this that compares the individual parameter um, changes. So I keep everything default except for one value, and I go from like the absolute minimum to the absolute maximum to determine how it changes um, as it increases. But before I get into the graphs that are generated for that, I go through the assumptions we went through. First of which is that after the nuclear reactor is decommissioned, um, we're just assuming that there's zero energy cost. Even though in actuality, the waste storage energy over the millennia um, will heavily affect the ROI of nuclear. And this is due to the fact that radioactive material is just radioactive for a very, very long time. Um, no matter how well we think we can store it, the earth will shift and our materials that we're using to store it will corrode. So we've got to keep revamping it throughout the years to prevent the stuff from leaking into the environment to harm people and animals. Uh, the second uh, assumption that we made is that the energy that is used, the electric energy that the nuclear power plant uses to run, it's running off of itself. So that essentially sets the thermal energy and electric energy requirements um, they're equivalent, as well as the output is equivalent on there. Um, this sets it slightly more conservative than the previous uh, data that I showed you. So it comes at about 5.8 rather than an 8. And it could be a lot more conservative if I was including future energy costs, but I can't because that's very complicated. Um, so the biggest factor that we found for the changing in the ROI of nuclear power plant is the burn up. And the burn up is essentially, um, it essentially just affects how much uranium is necessary to mine annually because it's um, like an energy concentration. So uh, every day a certain mass of uranium is converted to energy. And the, the more energy we get out of that same mass, the better it will be. Second one is the thermal efficiency, which is time your thermal energy out thermal energy in, so if you say burn some coal, um, it has a specific heat, but we're only capable of capturing um, so much of that heat and making it energy. And there is right here, so that 30% we could definitely do better, but there's a lot of mechanical issues like friction and uh, material science that prevent this. Um, the ore grade, this is, this it plateaus right here at about 0.3% ore that we're mining. Um, so that's the natural uranium out of all of the heavy metals. And currently we're right here at about 0.125%. Uh, and it's constantly falling. So as this just slightly goes less and less, the URI will eventually just drop to zero nuclear will be completely unfeasible. The lifetime of the reactor doesn't make much difference after about 50 years or 100 years here. Um, that's due to it, as it runs, it's basically paying back on what it took to build it and also paying back what has to be done after it's done working. The distribution loss is just stuff that gets lost between point A and point B. And uh, as Dr. Kari joked, uh, the only way I could like go all the way down here is if somebody just straight up stole all of the material. <laughs> Also, it's the only linear graph, so it's not um, The electricity ratio um, makes a big difference here. Um, after 50, it doesn't matter that much. It's, and this is the most interesting graph. Uh, what it is, it's showing the balance between uh, diffusion and centrifuge enrichment processes. So the tails is how much is lost from the, this, this percentage of U35 in any natural uranium deposit. And essentially, uh, this side here is really low energy. This is the centrifuge side. Or, yeah. 
um, and you take a large amount of material and you can get a small amount out, a small energy. You diffusion, you take a really large or a small amount and you try to get all of it out, but uh, if you do that, then it's really high energy and it uh, lowers your ERVI. Uh, lightweight water actors just use regular water and they're inexpensive to build. Well, heavy water is used deuterium water and they can use just straight natural drain. It, but it's lower because of how much more expensive they are to build. Um, so with all these graphs, we found that um, we found the points that it's basically optimal to have, and it shows where it plateaus, and we use that information to generate one final run to determine like, the highest our ERVI is, if we're really capable of getting to it technologically, and it came out to only about 17.2. Um, that's one point lower than wind. And that's with like 100% thermal efficiency and 0% loss in every field. So combining the fact that it's worse than wind and the fact that it's radioactive for, well, you and me and our children, their children, and basically for like the end of time, um, it's just not feasible to use much longer. Uh, this here combined, or this, this is a logarithmic radar chart that illustrates the differences between uh, where we are, the going orange, and we're going to have to get, to get to that. And the difference between a burn of a 45 and 1,000 gigawatt uh, days of thermal energy per ton is insane, not, not to mention the, the thermal efficiency. Finally, this is where this is where we are, but this is going a lot lower. This is where the wind is, so it would only be comparable with like oil. Thank you. Doors open for questions. Any questions? Yes, no. Um, do you know who did like the life cycle analyses of all these different processes and any details about? Uh, yes, it was a very large report that I ten percent of, but it was the University of Sydney. Uh, so this spreadsheet and the report and everything is all from them. Uh, yes. Do you know does your spreadsheet uh, allow for your reactors? No, it does not. But this is just um, the ones that are the ones that are mostly they're in use right now on your reactors as well as right? Yeah, for the yeah. national security reasons in the US. Yeah. So, <laughs> so at least with all this data is for the US though, so it's Shall I? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question that comes along. Uh, usually people have read about these things. So breeder year reactors are uh, not really up there, just research reactors. Uh, we don't have any functional breeder reactor as far as I know. Uh, that has produced, say, one gigawatt of power over, say, five years or so. That's what I mean by real technology, which has been shown to be functional and profitable uh, in an ERO-EI sense. So first of all, they're not even real. And that's, they're just research reactors. Um, the second thing is, he showed you a burn-up ratio. Uh, just go to the burn-up ratio slide. Okay? That's very fascinating. So, yeah, the current technology is there, right, where his arrow is. For burn up of is, is that the one which is 45 or yes so, yeah so what we did is we built the ideal because we are theoretical physicists we can do that we built the ideal breeder reactor that is every single atom of uranium that you put in the reactor fissions away so no no nothing left over so you put in the uranium everything is burned and you get on that graph to about 800 or so it's it's actually the current breeder technology is promising us 200. We did this hypothetical one, right, which is completely impossible, and it took us to 800. And the current breeder technology takes you to about 200, and that doesn't even include all the analysis of how you process the tails. Usually in the breeders, those tails you have been And that energy is not counted, and you get to 200. So this breeder is just um, a lot of propaganda. There's no real physics.
in terms of net energy surplus. Thank you. Can you can you show your last slide? Um, there are lots of points on there. Yeah. So I have no idea what. I'm not trying. Okay. So so the so the left scale tells me what the points are. Wait, what? No, I was trying to figure out what all the points were. So yeah, they're labeled with the left. Yeah, yeah this is the. I wanted to look at that carefully. Oh. But there's no, there's no, there's no vertical axis really. Well, the it's 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 more like a sideways bar graph. So we have your ERVI and then the height that it's associated with. So there's no numerical scale in the vertical axis, but I think you yeah, told there, us. Yeah, there's no vertical axis scale. But but it's a linear scale, right? So what is the value for total voltaic? Was it eight? Oh yeah, so for total voltaic is eight or ten, somewhere somewhere around there, which is on the x. It's, it's easier to list words like this than it is on the bottom. I see. And you just first. Oh. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. <coughs> this is more directed at some than it's my understanding, or at least I've read somewhere, which doesn't mean anything, of course. But the French take their spent fuel and re, uh, reprocess, it. It, reprocess it to the result that they get virtually every, is very, is much less waste from the fuel rods themselves. Now, whatever is in the surrounding material. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, they do reprocessing, but as I said, I mean, the, the latest uh, breeder technology that is being proposed, which will come online in about 30 years if everything works out technologically, will take you to 200. So the French are not going beyond 45. I, I doubt if they are going, maybe they'll, they'll go to 60 or something like that. And even then, for the reprocessed fuel, your EROEI is much lower. Because now you have to put in more energy to get that out. So it, it's always like the first pass is the low hanging fruit. You get it. Second pass, you have to work harder. Third pass, even harder. So, so the ERO, it goes down. Okay. So that, but still, that helps in the waste problem. Oh, uh, whatever that means. Yeah, on the 10, 20% scale, not on the 80, 90% scale. Yeah. You said it was 20? 20 years or something? It sounds like 20 to 30 years if everything works out. This is just reactor proposals. These are not real reactors. But it sounds okay. like Sanjay, it. what I don't understand is I don't know who's doing these breeder reactors because in the US they're, they're banned, they're outlawed. So that's why the development stopped. Yeah. So uh, President Carter yeah. outlawed the breeder reactor when it was a promising technology because of weapons proliferation issues, which is what Joseph mentioned. Is so that, there are two, as, so as far as I know. Is that still standing? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, there are two countries I know. more dangerous now. Right? right. There are two countries I know which are supposed leaders in breeder technology, the French and the Indians. But since it's nuclear technology, I mean, this is for civilian purposes, but um, mm -hmm. data is difficult to come by. So, so those are the two countries that are actually developing it? Right. Okay. But they have been developing it for years. So, yeah. And progress in this field is... Uh, glacier like best. Evan, it looks like uh, you're advocating coal as one of the highest uh, return on investments. Or that's, that's mostly because we can strip mine it. Yeah, but I mean, you're not taking into account the mitigating, the energy required to mitigate the negative effects of burning coal, right? Uh, well, my research was only on nuclear. This here is also from yeah. Charles Hall. Yeah. I mean, t Tom, we are not advocating anything. What he's saying is, look, here's the study of nuclear, and here's how it compares with everything else. So put the study in context. Um, so, and this is just from a reference. No, we are not advocating coal at all. Yeah. In fact, we are not advocating coal. No, but that, but yeah, that graph is. I'm advocating not using nuclear, nothing else. It's just the most Actually, that graph explains something else. The graph explains why humans went for hydro and coal first. That's sort of the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, so it, it, it puts uh, some perspective on why we, we exploited coal and hydro first.